Okay, so welcome folks. Uh, I'm, I mean, as a start, can if, if folks were here at the first webinar, can you maybe let us uh, uh, know in the chat as well? I'd be curious to know who is coming here for the first time and who is uh, here for the second time. Uh, so here's what we're gonna cover today. So we are gonna start off by reviewing what we covered last time very, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover a concept called small unit equivalence, which some people have found really useful. Uh, then we're going to talk briefly about overnight soaks, and we're going to get into buffers, virtual customers, product mixes, farmers market planning, and shifting products. So we are going to cover a lot of stuff here, and it's all going to relate back to the stuff we talked about in the first week. Uh, seeing a good amount of first and second time folks here, so uh, that's good. So second time folks, or first time folks, feel free to ask questions. Uh, some questions I might ignore with, with the idea that well, you should have been here for the first one. Uh, but hopefully the review uh, does help uh, catch you up a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna cover in just a few slides here, sort of the general stuff that we covered last week to get us to a base understanding of crop planning starting from the idea that the crop cycle starts with a customer placing an order. And this is sort of what sets, sets the whole thing in motion and helps us calculate and generate the tasks we need to complete in order to get a seed turned into a crop, turned into a product, and then uh, moved on to our customer. So the whole process starts with that order. Uh, once we have our tasks generated, we're starting with the seed. We soak and or sow that seed and cover it to get it into its uh, germination stage. And this is the point at which that seed turns into a crop. So that task represents a transition. Uh, then uh, partway at a certain point through the crop cycle, we uncover that crop and it goes into its greening or photosynthesis stage. Uh, and then, of course, we harvest that crop. And at that point, that crop becomes a product. So again, another transition there based on the task. Once we have a product, we can move that on to our customer. So with this concept in mind, we are always working backwards from a set harvest date to determine when to do those tasks. So the example we gave was we have a harvest on June 24th. Uh, this is working with speckled pea. We had nine days to maturity, so that takes us back to June 15th. And then when we sow on June 15th, we are basically thinking about, okay, how long are we going to leave covered for? So we count forward uh, to our uncover date, which would be June 19th. So in that regard, it's a very simple system. So for, all, for those of you who spent an hour and 10 minutes with us last week, there you go, two minutes, we just covered everything there. So sorry for wasting a week last week. Um, obviously we got to go into more detail, so uh, hopefully it wasn't a waste. Uh, then we also, we were thinking about our product from pea. So there we're talking about our, um, our pea crop, but uh, in order to sell the crop to our customers, we have to have a product. So we had this sort of sample product line with a 100, 250, 450 gram sizes with different prices. And in this case, we've got some live trays. And then we have the details about our crop, uh, which gives us a sense of, our, sense of our, our expected yield, our sowing rate, days to maturity, things like that. So this is the information we use to make our calculations. So we did some of these calculations last week. We imagined an order for June 24th, which is our set harvest date, in which we had 25 small pea, eight medium pea, and 20 large pea, each with their own, um, each with their own weights. And so uh, we can do a simple calculation there, which gives us our total weight. And then we'll throw some live trays on that in order to make things a little more complicated, but not really. And so when we look at this in terms of what our needs are, in order to calculate how many trays we need, we're using the total weight of all our products for peas, which was 13,500 grams, divided by our expected yield per tray of speckled pea, which is 400 grams. And that calculation tells us we need to sow 33.75 trays of speckled pea, 
nobody in the history of microgreens has sowed 0.75 uh, trays of anything. Actually, that's not true. I'm sure people have. I'm sure I probably have, actually. Uh, so we round that up to 34 trays. And then, of course, we had those live trays we needed to account for. And so we know we need to sow 38 10 by 20 trays on June 15th or whatever the day was, uh, June 16th, soaking on June 15th, sowing on June 16th to make sure that these are ready for our expected harvest day. So there we go there. So that's, we really kind of looked at that in a real step-by-step -step manner last week to understand how we get to that. And, and in, in essence, it is, a, it is a really simple process, but I think as, you, as you're in production and you have a lot to manage, this can actually start to get a little more complicated uh, when things don't go as expected. So crop planning, like any spreadsheet or software work we do, is just a model. It's a representation of what we think will happen, crossed with what we hope will happen, crossed with what we expect will happen. And those things aren't always true. So we want to have some buffers and ways to uh, adapt our system when things don't uh, uh, turn out as we think. So everybody up to speed there? Second time or first time folks, you're like, oh yeah, I get it. Glad I didn't come last week. Good. Okay, and again, you guys can throw, uh, just throw questions in the chat and I will do my best to answer them in real time as we go here. Uh, okay, first thing we're gonna cover here is rounding up. Very, very simple, we've already covered it. You always round your calculated tray count up, okay? So 33.75 trays rounds up to 34 trays. 33.05 trays rounds up to 34 trays. So by rounding up, you are always getting a, uh, I love to seeing my name just keep popping up. It's like I'm complimenting myself. I love it. Not egotistical at all. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're always rounding up. And this is the first way we can kind of buffer uh, any uh, um, discrepancies in our expected yield. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, another option you can do here as you get, as your scale gets bigger, you know, if you're, if you're sowing 100 trades of something, rounding up from 99.1 uh, to, um, to, to 100 actually isn't giving you that much more because it's a small percentage of a tray, which is only 1% of the total trades. So one of the things we used to do uh, for our crops as, as our production grew is we would always round up to the nearest multiple of three. So if, if our uh, thing showed us we needed to sow 17 crops or 17 trays, we would round it up to 18. If it showed we needed to do 16 trays, we would round it up to 18. So we were always doing that in multiples of three. One, because a lot of time they gave us a bigger buffer, though not always. And number two is we always stacked our trays in multiples of three. We never stacked them in fours or fives or anything, or even twos. We were always doing threes. And so that made it so we were always working in multiples of three. And so it kind of, it kind of seems like, oh, we've done all these specific calculations and then you're just gonna round up by multiples of three. Um, yeah, that's the system that worked for us. And so maybe as we get into things, you'll understand why that actually still works. So yeah, always round up, very simple concept there. I just spent way too much time on that actually. Okay, so the second thing we're gonna talk about is this idea of small unit equivalence. And so I, don't, I can't remember why we came up with this idea uh, and it's not anything new, other people use this. And this is the idea of converting all your product sizes into ratios of your smallest size. And so in our system here, our large clams equal 4.5 of our smallest and our medium clams equal 2.5 of our smallest. And so we always just found looking at everything uh, through the lens of the smallest unit we sold uh, was really helpful. And a lot of folks that have, have purchased our spreadsheet find the same thing. And, and in our online version of the Crop Planner Seed Leaf, we don't have that. And I've had a few complaints about that. So we, we might add it. And so this actually just helps over time, this becomes a little more intuitive and it helps with shifting products around, which is something we're gonna talk in, in the uh, about a little bit later. So, so yeah, we always have this idea of 
you know, if, if I need another large, you know, uh, a clamshell or bag of P, I know that I'm going to, if I need to move stuff, I'm going to need 4.5 small units worth. So it just allows us to compare everything in that regard. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Some people may never use this. I mean, it really is unnecessary, but some people find that perspective quite helpful. Okay, so third thing here is overnight soaks. Now, really overnight soaks just add a little bit of complexity to the, to the crop cycle. And even though I talked about P last week, I didn't show the calculation with an overnight soak because it was just, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. There's very, very few crops that, that I've done as a regular overnight soak. Uh, P is the only one I've consistently soaked overnight. Uh, but every once in a while, I've done that with sunflower and a few other crops. So it's not something you use a lot, but it's important because it means you're not doing everything on the same day. Essentially, you are so soaking on one day and you are sowing the next. And so it, it changes your, your crop cycle uh, a bit. So when we look at our model that we looked at earlier, if we count back our nine days to, to maturity from June 24th, we are soaking on June 15th, but then we are sowing on June 16th. Our, our days to germination are four from our soaking date, so that still takes us back to the same uncovering date. So it, it can add a little bit of complexity. Why this was a challenge for us is in our crop cycle, our soaking of our pea shoots was on a Wednesday, and it was the only task we ever had to do on a Wednesday. We didn't sow anything else. We didn't harvest anything. So it was really important for us to schedule that somebody came in on Wednesday evening, soaked that pea so the, the Thursday morning crew could sow that pea. If this is like a, a pain in the ass, one of the things you can do is you can soak that crop early in the morning and then you can sow it later in the evening. So you can do that sort of 12 hour window within a day. Uh, but then you've kind of lost that day. Like that day isn't actually a day of growth, it's a soaking day. So it just depends on your crop cycle, making sure you can get it to mature when you want. Uh, I found having to uh, soak something in the morning and then maybe come back that evening actually more problematic. But if you're doing production from home, you know, maybe that works for you. So something to keep in mind, uh, if, you're, if you're doing an overnight soak, you're, you're adding another day to your cycle or you're just adding another step to the cycle in that regard, so. Uh, okay, no questions here. Everybody's pretty good with things so far. I know this is all pretty simple at this point, so. Okay, so here's where we're gonna get into something uh, a little more uh, to help us fine tune the calculations we come up with. So this is what we looked at uh, last week was our, 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 our product line of our pea shoots. And we did our calculations with this. We've got our 100, 250, and 450 gram sizes. And then we just multiply those by how many of each of those sizes we're selling to get our calculation. So what's the problem with this approach? I'm gonna throw that out to you all there to give you a break from my voice. No one wants to take a stab at that one. All right. Oh, a good a stumper. I like one there. Okay. So, so restating the question here. So, th this is our product line, and and I'm showing our product weights here, and I'm doing our ca our our calculations, our crop calculations based on on our our uh, our label weight here. But what is the problem with, with using these numbers for doing our calculations in our crops relative to our packing? So I'm gonna ask another question which has the answer embedded in it. Uh, and, and that question is how often or how many times or have you ever packed a package with exactly 100 grams in it? It's, it's such a pain in the ass. I mean, you're oh, taking this sunflower out. Oh, now it's a little light. So I put two back in. I find that, yeah. So I find that stuff so tedious and cost wise, you're like, well, it, it costs you more labor. Well, you know, 20 seconds and 30 seconds of labor, you know, technically it adds up, but it, it doesn't add up that much. So I'm not too worried about that. It's more about the mental state of being nitpicky like this. So if we look at the, um, if we look at the, uh, the idea that 
we don't want to pack so precisely that we have to be nitpicky while we're packing. Um, the idea is you're, you're, you're going to pack faster here and you're erring on the side of giving the, the customer more product. You never want to underpack. You cannot have 99 grams in a 100 gram package. You can't do it. But you can have 105, even 110. It's like, ah, whatever, you know, get it out there. We've got lots of crop this week. Um, so yeah, you've got to really make sure you've got enough in there to meet your label requirements. But tendency is going to be to overpack. So I've, if I've done my calculation at 100 grams for my crops, but I'm packing 105 grams, my calculations are going to be off. And so here is where we have the idea of we have our label weight, and then we have our packing weight. And the label weight is what we show the customer uh, about how much they're getting. And the packing weight is what we use for our calculations. Now, you might think as a general idea that you, um, you know, might want to use a percentage of, of, of your, your product weight as, as packaging or as a buffer, but that's not the approach I would take, um, you know, using five grams for a 100 gram package and using five grams for a 450 gram package give you the same result. I don't want 45 grams of a buffer for my large clams because I'm never going to overpack that much. I just want to know that I can, and as you also know, you can grab a handful of sunflower and get pretty close to your, your weight over time. And so you learn to get it pretty close and then you're, you're a little less nitpicky as you go to that sort of final stage before you close things up. So in this case, if we shift from 100 grams to 105 grams, we're adding some more, pro, uh, a little more crop for each of our products there. Oh, let me just pass that, sorry. Um, Uh, oh my God. <laughs> okay, here we go. So yeah, what we're doing is we're just adding a little more. So for all this, we had 13,000 grams. We're only adding a, an additional 265 grams, which isn't a whole lot of extra crop. Like this is actually less than a tray of pea there, but it gives us that little bit of buffer. And if you end up packing everything at really close to hundred grams or 250 grams, that's great. That means you might have a little bit of extra crop, which you can use for something else. So that's the idea of a buffer. Um, but the idea here isn't so much that it's a buffer. It just makes your packing a little quicker because you don't need to be as precise. And yeah, I think it's always better to overpack than to underpack because uh, you know underpacking technically is illegal. So don't do that. Uh, so does that make sense in terms of you've got your weights that you're showing your customer and what you're basically saying to your customer is this package is guaranteed to have a minimum of this amount. Uh, and then you've got your slightly higher weight that you're using to do your calculations. So quite simple there. Um, yeah. Okay, everyone's clear on that. Good. I see a thumbs up there. So that's good. All right. So funnily enough, <laughs> I don't do this. <laughs> I use, I use the label weight uh, um, because we did that. And I didn't think of this idea till afterwards. And I found where our, our calculations were generally close enough anyway. So, uh, but uh, it does allow you to be a little more precise. And as you can see, it's not a lot more crop. So yeah, all that said, I don't do it. Okay. So the next concept is that of the virtual customer. So, we have this idea because, as, as I've talked about earlier, we're talking about a system that is driven by orders from customers. And so if that's the case, well, how do you get new customers? How do you account for crops when there's new customers if it's customers that are driving your crop planning process? So it's a very valid question. Uh, and we do that by having buffers. And so a buffer is basically extra crop just in case. That's basically how I define a buffer. And the buffer is buffering you against two general things. One is you get new orders. I mean, even though you might use this grow to order system, which means if a new customer comes on, you're like, okay, great. We'll get you your crop in 10 to 12 days because we sow to order, which means we don't have any crop for you because why would we? We've, you know, we've, we've never grown for you before. Um, but you don't want to ever turn a customer away either. So you need to be able to prepare for that. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, you just get a yield that's lower than expected. For some reason, you know, the weather was, uh, wasn't was right or, you know, you're, there was a power outage. So you were without lights and heat for a while 
or you were without air conditioning for a while, something threw your crop production off. So you've got a little bit extra there to play with. And earlier in your, your growing endeavors, you're gonna use buffers a lot. And then as you grow and as you get more experienced, you're gonna use them less and less. Uh, and generally, I mean, did we, I can't think of where we left off with the food peddlers, but we, once you get to a certain scale and you're producing lots and, you know, we're talking dozens of, of kilograms, you know, or more, even, you know, a hundred or more kilograms a week, uh, things shift around enough that you don't really need a buffer. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, the other thing you might use a virtual customer for is for samples. So in order to get new product out to customers, I mean, the best thing to do is just get it to them. And so you need to grow that crop in order to package it up for products to give out as samples. So, so that's something that is part of your crop plan. I think a lot of people would take the approach of saying like, hey, we're just going to sow some extra crops once we've done our calculations. But those extra crops should be part of your calculations. And that's important because as we talked about a little bit, you know, in our calculations here, we were showing our potential revenue, but whenever we sow a crop, there is also a cost associated with that. And so if my crop plan says sow 30 trays, my crop planner is going to calculate the cost of sowing 30 trays. But if I sow 32, then I'm spending more than my calculations show. So, you know, we talked about this last week is you want to sow everything with purpose, everything with intention, uh, and you want to be sowing that based on, you know, uh, on, a, on a projection. So in this case, our projection is we're going to send out samples to folks. So this is how we allocate our, our products to non-customers. And one of the things you can do is you just, you set targets each week, okay. We, we need new customers, let's try to, you know, hit four new restaurants, which means we're going to grow these samples, and then you just add that as part of your, um, as part of your calculations. And you could have a customer called samples, and you just do it randomly, or you could literally have the, the potential customers there, what you're going to give to them, and so your crop plan is actually calculating those as if they are orders. The difference between this and an order is these are not going to have a price associated with them because you're giving them away for free. So they have a cost, but they don't have a revenue. And so those things are important in keeping your projections um, uh, accurate. The other nice thing about samples is if, even if you've got a buffer, you have a bad yield and you're like, oh my God, we don't have enough to meet our orders. It's like, sorry folks, no samples this week. We'll get them to you next week. So this becomes a management thing where you have to have this idea of what am I going to prioritize? Am I going to prioritize my current customers so I can keep them or the new customers so they can be an ongoing customer? And it's actually, you know, it's, it's, a, bit of a, it's a bit of a conundrum because you kind of want to do both. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit how you potentially can do both as we get into one of the next sections there. So does this idea of virtual customer, customers make sense to people? Yeah, thumbs up, some nods, good. I can only see a portion of you. So uh, Yanni and Cecilia are speaking for the group. Hope you're all okay with that. <laughs> I know there was no democratic process to determine that, but such is, such is life. Okay. Now, this is one of my favorite topics, uh, product mixes. And so this is a product that contains multiple crops. Now, I had the, our crop planning spreadsheet on the market for, for quite a few years before somebody said, can we do product mixes with this? And I'm like, ah, oh, um, can you use sample cost for marketing? You're marketing your sample. Um, you mean in terms of writing off that as an expense? Is that what you mean by there? And I'm, I'm just talking to myself here. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you, yes, but you're already writing that off because your cost is your soil and your seeds and your labor, and those are already expenses. So there's no additional write-off. So you can't say, well, if this was a product, it was worth five or $10, so that's what I'm writing off. That's not an expense. Your write-off is the same, is the same uh, elements you would put into it, your seed, your soil, and your labor, and you're already writing those off. So you can't write it off twice. Um, but you can allocate that you can decide how you want to allocate those costs. And this is probably way more complicated than it needs to be. You could say like, oh, that seed and soil and labor cost, that portion of that, I'm going to put that in my marketing budget. Um, I don't do that. I find it's way too complex, but at a bigger scale, you might do that. Um, okay, good question. I had this question at one point as well. So, 
Okay, so a product mix is a product containing multiple crops. Uh, the food peddlers never did product mixes. Um, that was a, a, a poor judgment call on my part, I think. Um, I was of the belief that if people want mixes, they should buy multiple products and mix it themselves. They should decide what kind of mix they want to do. Uh, but the reality it is people like things done for them. They want stuff pre-mixed and, and mixes do very well. So one of the many mistakes I made even as a successful grower, um, but calculating uh, how much crop to grow for product mixes is a little bit more complicated though it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not exceedingly complicated. So let's look at this in steps. So our first step in creating a product mix is determining the crops in your mix. So we're gonna work with this theoretical product called the spicy nutty mix. And anybody wanna guess, um, there's three crops in this product. Anybody wanna guess the three crops that go into our spicy nutty mix? I mean, I expect only right answers here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm go for it. Um, spicy salad, um, sunflowers, shoot, sunflower shoots. That's it, That's, there's three. I know, I'm thinking of the third one. I got two. Yeah, I mean, this, this could be many things. This is a super, super obnoxious question on my part. So in this spicy nutty meat, uh, uh, spicy, spicy nutty mix, it's sunflower, radish, and arugula. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a few different combinations. This is sort of my favorite combination. I think it's, it's a nice mix. Uh, mustard is another good one. Yeah, totally. That would be a great one as well. So. You do whatever you want in your spicy nutty mix. So step one is determining what products or what crops are gonna go in that product. So just throwing it out there now, what is step two? Yeah, I, I heard something that kind of cut out though. So yeah, so next is deciding the percentage, exactly. So looking at our proportions, and you can do this in different orders. So uh, Cecilia, you're also right. So we want 50% sunflower, 25% radish, 25% arugula by weight. So then uh, what is step three? Uh, Cecilia is already ahead of the game here, is determining your product uh, sizes and prices. Again, technically we don't need the prices to do a crop calculation, but it's in there because if we're gonna do the calculation on how much to sow, we might as well do the calculation on our revenue. So we're gonna stick with the same sizing we used for our peas in this case, 100 grams, 250 grams, and 450 grams. And then we need to calculate our crop needs based on our orders. So going back to that same order that we did for peas, We'll do 25 small spicy nutty mix at 100 grams each, not 105, because by the time I realized, oh, I should use the packing weight, I didn't want to do the calculations again. Uh, so eight of our medium mix and then 20 of our large mix. So we get the same value that we got for our peas, 13,500 grams. So we're always going with this idea that we're getting our total we need, and then we work backwards from that to figure out how much crop we need. So going back to our table there, our total weight is 13,500 grams. And we're going to take our proportion. So 50% of 13,500, 25% of 13,500, and then do the calculation for each of those crops. And then what I like to do when I'm doing stuff like this is I like to do a double check. So I have the total there again. So my total weight was this, I'm breaking it down into these different sections and then I'm double checking. And I do that double check just to make sure my calculations are correct. And I do incorrect calculations all the time. I mean, some of these things, when you're talking about percentage or change in percentage, you, you just, you, you make the wrong, you use the wrong formula. So I like to do lots of double checks just to make sure that's good. So then just like we did with our peas, we need to go through and we need to take a look at how many trays to grow. So we need 6,750 grams of sunflower and our yield per tray is 600 grams. We need 11.25 trays, which we round up to 12. Same process for the radish, same process for the arugula. And this is good because it, it's an interesting contrast. So you can see I've, I've purposely put in two different uh, 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 yields for the radish and the arugula. So we need the same amount of product, but because they have different yields, 
uh, we need different numbers of trays for them. And this is one of those things where you might just go, okay, I need 10 trays of each. And obviously it's not gonna work that way because how much crop you need for your product depends on the proportion of your product weight, your total product weight and your yield for that specific crop. The other thing which we talked about last week, which I won't go into again here is this probably also has three different sowing dates. Your sunflower, radish and arugula are gonna get sowed potentially on three different days because they have different crop cycles, but you want them to all mature on the same day. Sunflower might be nine days, radish might be eight days, and arugula might be seven days. So your calculation gets you to sow them at the right time and the right amount in order to have them ready on your target harvest date. Okay, product mixes make sense to folks. And in the next weeks, in next weeks, actually, no, I want to, I, I made a note here that I actually wanted to go through and take a look at that. So I'm just going to shift here to this screen. A little more. So people are seeing the spreadsheet now. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. So I need to close, uh, I need to shrink the chat down here because it's in my way. So one of the things that I think people find hard about crop planning is we're just, we're just mixing all, uh, our, we're, we're not thinking about, okay, this tray of sunflower goes to that product and this tray of sunflower goes to that product. We're grouping everything together. And so we, we sometimes can be a little unsure of our calculations. So here in this, this sample, I've got a spicy mix, which is similar to the spicy nutty mix. And it's part of this whole list of orders and I can go over to my, I'm gonna close this here. So here's sort of my, my calculations that come out of this process is, you know, I've got some of my, my, my spicy mix here is I think radish, sunflower and arugula. So same one. Um, and I can see, but I can't tell from my tray count what proportion of that belongs to those mixes. So you have to get comfortable with, with uh, trusting that your calculations are correct. And I, I'll often go through and, and do a little bit of a double check. So if I change my spicy mix here, the number of uh, the quantity from 18 to say 10, it's gonna take a minute, but we're gonna see that our values here change. So our sunflower, we've got 30, 18 and 20. You can see the bar appears working away. <laughs> it's a very, very big spreadsheet. So whenever I make a change like this, it has to do millions of calculations. And somebody at Google is going, ah, Chris is working on a spreadsheet again today. Ugh, what were we thinking? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I spend a lot of time waiting for this bar up here. Trust me, it's gonna change, it's gonna change. <laughs> So I do this a lot. I, I'm often changing these numbers just to make sure, because sometimes you change the number and it doesn't change here. And you're like, oh, I've made a calculation error somewhere. So um, this is taking a particularly long time, maybe because I've got a Zoom call going at the same time. Oh, so close, so close. Okay, so and now I'm down to 29, 17, and 19. So it's only taken uh, like one tray off of each, even though I took 10 prod or eight products off there. And again, it's because there's only a small amount of, of, of product actually coming from each of those trays because the spicy mix is taking a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and a little bit from there. So I often double check these calculations a lot in the beginning to make sure I've not made a, a wrong assumption. And so, yeah. Uh, and then I can, another thing I can do is I've got my small size here. If I change that to the large size, 10 large is gonna create a calculation change over here as well. Uh, we'll let it do its thing. I do see a question here. Uh, okay, in my product, I, okay, I'm, I'm gonna uh, interpret here. I'm gonna set my salad mix, my some, oh, is the salad mix. I think there's some translation here to 55 kroner, but in orders it says 115, why? Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand if, if I'm interpreting that question right. If, if the KR is say kroner and that's re relating to um, price or if it's weight. So maybe if you can, if I can ask that question another way, that'd be great. <laughs> price. Okay, you've, you, you've set your, your, your price mix to 55, but in orders it says 115. 
Uh, I don't know. And are you are you using this spreadsheet for that? So here it might just be a calculation error, or uh, so you've got your own system in that in that regard. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, so oh, you okay? You are okay. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure I fully understand that. Maybe we can look at that afterwards. So you can follow up with me. You can look at that. And again, when I so just going back here, you can see now our number of trays have changed uh, based on the change in size here. So yeah. So basically, we can double check those things uh, all the time. So I'm going to change this back to 18. So it's all where it was. Um, and there's a question up here. So some seed companies sell seed mixes, such as spicy salad mix. Do you find it works better or is the variance in grow rates problematic? So this is a very good question. Number one, if somebody is selling you a seed mix, they better have figured out that those seeds all grow at about the same rate and in the same conditions. And that's what allows you to, to make a mix out of them. If somebody sold you like a, a mixture of like sunflower, pea and arugula, I would never buy from that company ever again. Uh, so I tend not to do mixes. I mean, I don't do product mixes. Clearly, I have a thing against mixes. I rarely do uh, crop mixes as well. When I would do a crop mix would, would be when they are very, very similar crops. So we would do like multiple types of radish in a mix, for example, because we might want to use like a regular green radish with a red daikon, for example. They grow pretty much at the same rate, so we can mix them pretty well. And even with the brassicas, so like kohlrabi, broccoli, uh, kales, different things, they are actually all the same crop. They've just been selected for different things over time. They grow in very similar circumstances. So those are ones you can mix together. So if you're doing a mix, you want to make sure um, uh, you want to make sure that you're doing uh, crops that are very, very similar in growth cycle and in growing conditions. So that's important there. Uh, spreadsheets in the app. So with Seedleaf, when people pay for Seedleaf, they get, uh, we have some templates that are uploaded. So they, they are filled out versions of this for three different scenarios. Uh, so I think it's, or two or three different scenarios, like what it would look like if you were just doing farmer's markets, what it would look like if you were doing a mix of farmer's markets and restaurants and grocers, and what it would look like if you were doing, say, restaurants and grocers and no farmers markets. So they're different models to give you a sense of what the what the costs and revenue would look like for those things. Yeah. So those those because we offer a trial version, you, you don't get the spreadsheets until you've paid for the app. So um, so yeah. So so it is, and it's easier with a spreadsheet like this to start with a filled out version so you can see what it's supposed to look like starting from scratch can be a little complicated because you're like ah oh, like this i'm not sure if this is right so you can always have that sort of uh, original version to compare back to okay so i hope i've answered some questions in there um if folks have other questions about this that is good i'm going to go back to the slides which are here okay change screens here so many okay there we go okay so everybody get a good sense of doing product mix calculations oh no i did want to show one well no i don't need to show it yes i do i'm going to show it <laughs> hold on i wanted to show uh... okay so what i showed here was the orders but i do have the calculation here in my crops and products so these are all my regular uh, products and crops. So I have my mixes here. So here's my spicy mix. I've got my different sizes of 100 grams, 200 grams, and 375 grams in this case. And then down below, I've chosen my crops and my proportions here. So this is how I sort of laid it out in this spreadsheet. There's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, and then translating this into that order sheet actually is, was the most complicated thing I had to do. Um, but yeah, we now have to sort of account for, for each of these within the bigger calculation. So you can see with some of these more advanced calculations, you have to go through multiple steps to get there, uh, to get everything sort of uh, displayed in the same way. So um, yeah, this is how it's done here. And this is just a, a drop down menu. So I'm only selecting crops that I have uh, and products I have information for. So you don't accidentally put in something that doesn't exist, which, uh, which can happen. Okay. 
back to where we were here. So next week we will, I'm, well, we'll talk about next week later. Okay, stay focused, Chris, stay focused. Okay. Okay, so the next topic here is gonna be farmers markets. And this is another thing. So, uh, so I just gotta move things back around again. Okay, so calculating your product needs for farmers markets can be very, very challenging um, because you actually don't know what you're gonna sell at a farmers market. Oh my God, so many screens here. Uh, so this is just a yeah, quick look at, so with the food peddlers, we used to cycle our stuff to market. So I thought I'd break up all the words on the screen with a little photo of how we used to display our stuff at the market when we were doing things by bicycle. Uh, luckily, this market was very close to where we were uh, because it's very, very heavy to pull on a bike. But it was really nice to have, like, be able to pull everything to the market and then just display it uh, within our trailer there. So um, it was one of the things that really draw, drew a lot of customers to us. Okay, so farmers market projections are based on your expected sales. So our orders for customers and, and uh, like restaurants and grocers and home deliveries were all based on orders that people had made. So like in many cases, they had even already paid for them. So it was a very, very secure thing. But farmers markets are based on what we think we are going to sell, which gets easier over time, but in the beginning can be a challenge. So when you start doing farmers markets, the way to calculate your sales in the beginning is to just guess. <laughs> and, and I don't have a more clever answer, but there's uh, two things you can do to make your guess more accurate. So one is, is, is to visit the market you're planning on attending and get a sense of how busy it is. I mean, obviously a busier market is gonna have a higher potential for sales. A slower market will have slower potential for sales. So the second way you can have a more accurate guess in the beginning is, can you talk to you know, microgreens growers, maybe who sold at that market before, and, and it can give you some insights onto how much they sold. You could talk to the certain people that are selling produce to get a sense what they're selling. So in the beginning, there's a lot of guesswork. So the more questions you can ask, the more people you can talk to, the, the more accurate you will be. If there's a current microgreens grower at that market, you could try and ask them, but when they see you there the next week with microgreens, they might be pissed. So uh, maybe not the best approach. So in the beginning, it really is a guess. But as you do more and more markets, what you're gonna do is you're going to base your expected sales on your past sales. So, you know, you can only sell as much as you bring. So start by, by uh, growing and uh, bringing what you hope to sell. If you wanna make $500 a market, you need to bring $500 worth of product. If you wanna do $1,000 per mark market, you need to do a, bring $1,000 worth of product, simple as that. If you bring too little, you might sell out too quickly. Now, if you bring too much, you might be taking a lot home. Uh, and there's a saying at the farmer's market, it's better to sell out than to pack out. Um, but really you wanna sell out 15 minutes before the market ends. That's, that's your goal there. So you've got a little bit of time at the end to start packing up, chat with your neighbors, things like that. So yeah, you're really gonna use over time your past sales to determine your projected sales. And so in this regard, it's really important to record your actual sales so you know what you're doing, so, you're, so there's no guesswork in that. Uh, and it's hard to document everything, but the better you can document, the better. Now, it's important to understand that what, one of the reasons mar markets are so challenging also is because they are variable. And they're variable in three uh, sort of specific ways. So number one is from week to week. You know, one week you might do really well at the market, the next week might be a little slower. You know, maybe it's a long weekend. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a conflicting event that's pulling a lot of people that might have gone to the farmer's market to something else. Um, all sorts of things can happen. So week to week, it's really variable. And what we found, even though we, we always did a consistent amount for, for markets is one market would be up here, then the next one would be here, one would be here, the next one would be here. And we could never figure out that pattern. I mean, clearly lots of people are buying bi-weekly, but we could never figure out why we could never get that consistent growth. And it was like that for years. So we kept it fairly consistent because we always wanted to have as much as we think we could sell. 
Uh, and then at the end of that, when we had extra product, we would just trade that with other vendors. So we learned to work with that extra product a lot as well. So the second way that markets are variable is seasonally. And if you're doing markets year round, you're gonna notice this like, oh, this is our peak time. This is when everybody wants microgreens. And for the food peddlers, that was winter. So I'm, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. The weather in the winter here sucks, but it doesn't suck so bad that we can't do an outdoor market. And so at outdoor markets, you get lots of farmers with their storage crops, turnips, potatoes, beets, carrots, but nobody has fresh greens. So in the winter, when you show up with big bunches of microgreens, you do really well. Spring is pretty good too, but as summer comes along, sales actually can plummet pretty hard. So, so why, why do sales plummet in the summer? Everybody has greens. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. One is, um, yeah, there's so much available. Uh, there is more greens, so people can get their greens from different sources. And, and three is like, there's so much stuff to choose from and they've been eating microgreens for months. I mean, we can, we can talk about how great microgreens are to our heart's content, but you all know you can only eat so much of them. It's anything, you can only eat so much chocolate. Well, okay, that's maybe a little extreme, but um, yeah, I mean, people like to vary their diet. And so when they've had microgreens all spring and early summer and then salad greens start coming out and then all these other crops are like, ah, it's like, yeah, like it's like, we wanna mix things up. We'll come back to microgreens later. So it's really important to understand that seasonality because that uh, you, you wanna sort of shift your general sales based on that. So we would grow and sell less in the summer and we would grow and sell more in the winter. And we just accounted for that uh, seasonally. Um, yeah, and then in the heat as well, it's, it can actually be really, really difficult to, to keep your product uh, in good shape in the heat as well. So very good point. Uh, and so the third one uh, in terms of variability is based on weather. Now, when we're doing a farmer's market next Saturday, we are sowing the crop for that this Thursday. And so I can look at the weather forecast for next Saturday, which is what, eight, nine days away. And weather forecasts are getting fairly accurate, but the reality is there's no way you can know. So you, you sow your crop to do a thousand dollar market, and on Friday, you're like, oh my God, we're going to get 30 millimeters of rain tomorrow, you know, an inch and a half of rain. Nobody's coming to the market. There's no way we're going to sell all this product. There's nothing you can do about that. There's very, very little you can do about that. So it's one of those things you learn to live with and you learn to adapt to. So it's important to be aware of all these variables to a certain degree. And over time, you learn how to anticipate these and adapt to these. So if you do have the wrong amount of product, um, you can accommodate for that. So that leads us into the, I think this is the last uh, thing I'm gonna to cover today is what I call shifting products. So shifting products is the idea of moving products between customers to adapt current orders to meet new order needs. And so this is kind of, I mean, I love using calculators and software to, to help run my business. But the reality is you have to understand when it's important for you as, as the business manager to make decisions that your software cannot make for you. And so this is one of those examples where uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, you want to be able to shift things around because you have too much or too little crop. Uh, so you have to, you also have to, there's an art of knowing when you want your software or your spreadsheet to do the calculations and when the onus is on you to figure that out. So in, in, in our approach develop, to developing Seedleaf, which is our online crop planning software, we, we've got a, a feature on it, which people can put suggestions in all the time. Like, what do you need in here? We take those and some of them we try to implement as soon as possible and other things we kind of put them on deck that we'll get to. And we often get people asking for features that I just respond to them and say, no, like we're not gonna do that. That is your job to do that. And if you rely on the software to do that, uh, the software will get it wrong more than you. Um, and I mean, I, we think your business will be less successful because of that. So, I mean, th this idea that the customer is always right. <sighs> I don't know about that. So it is important to understand what you need your software for and what you need to be making decisions for yourself. And again, this is really based on this idea that we're really trying to grow to order. 
we don't really want to have excess product because that means we're using seeds and soil and labor for a product that we don't have a market for. So that's why we want to be um, uh, as careful as possible with our crop planning, but we also want to have extra product to invite new customers in. So we have to do so. Yeah. Why do we need to shift products between customers? So number one, yield is lower than expected. You know, you're expecting 600 grams per, per crop for a tray of sunflower, but you get 500 or you get 300. I mean, it happens. I mean, no matter how good you are, you have weeks, you're like, what the shit? Like we are screwed. Um, so yeah, what's going to happen is you're going to have, I mean, I'm just having traumatic flashbacks now. Um, Jesus, <laughs> I won't get into that. Um, so yeah, you, you are not going to have enough crop to fill, fulfill your product orders. Uh, so the next reason is you have new orders. I mean, even you've got your buffers, so you're accounting for new orders, but you need to get a call. Like we want five pounds of sunflower. We want, you know, uh, you know, 20 of each of your, your smaller stuff for our grocery store. And you're like, like, we just don't have that. Why would we have that much product where there was no reason to grow that? But at the same time, you're like, wow, that's, th those are some good sales. And so how do we, how do we capture those sales? And then the third one in terms of shifting product is when you get order cancellations. And so you've grown a product for somebody and even though you've told them you need 10 days notice to cancel a product, I mean, it happens. And so you, you wanna be sort of shifting with that. So you've gotta be able to move stuff around and, and software cannot do this for you. This is something you need to do yourself. So I'm gonna shift back, I'm gonna shift back to the spreadsheet to look at how we might do that. Um, uh, but the thing here is our goal is that everybody gets some product. So even though we have our existing customers and these new customers that we want to fulfill and we don't have enough product for all of them, our goal is to get some product to everybody. So let's go to, well, I'm going to go to the spreadsheet to, to show that because I think it makes a little more sense to do it that way. So back here, we're going to go to our orders. Just need to shift this. Okay. So this is our, I need to move this over as well. Do, 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 do. Okay. So these are our orders for June 28th. You can see we've got some from grocery stores here. We've got a diner, our coffee place, you know, Kate's Cafe. And this is actually a small number of orders. Like the food peddlers, we might've had 20 or 30, 30 customers to, to deliver to in a week. And so that you've got more to choose from. But let's say this, this is our situation. You can see we've got some buffers in here. We've got two trays of sunflower, two trays of pea shoots. We've got some samples in here. We've even got some staff. We've got like, you know, we're growing some extra sunflower for our staff. But we have, uh, we have some new orders come in and we need more, more product. So the first thing we do is we look at, so here, actually stepping back you often know well before harvest day if, you're, if your yield is gonna be lower than expected. In, in fact, the first indication I get of where my yield is gonna be is when I'm uncovering for my germination stage. And literally you're taking off your covering trays, you're looking at your crop and instantly you're like, we're behind. You almost know instantly. And, and in the beginning, maybe not, but over time you're gonna be like, oh, well, sunflower sure have a lot of holes on them, or boy, I can't see much stem. I mean, they're not as tall as they should be at this point, which means my yield's probably going to be a little low, and I'm already thinking about how I'm going to deal with that. So you've got a bit of lead time. It's not like uh, on harvest day, you're going to be like, oh my God, we're really, really short. If you're going to be that short, uh, extremely short, you're going to know this ahead of time. So it's important that you're, you're observing your crop cycle almost every day, so you understand, are we on track? Is everything looking good? Am I going to have to start mitigating this problem by getting in touch with customers? So that's one thing to think about is being able to look at that ahead of time. So the next thing I'm doing is I'm looking at my orders. Okay, what do we have for orders this week? Okay, Bob's Grocery has their usual 10. Jane has their usual 18. Actually, no, Jane usually does 15. They wanted to bump it up to 18 because they've been selling more, which is great. Don't know that we're going to be able to bump it up this week. So I'm starting to think about this, right? I'm looking at these other things. Bill's Diner, well, they're only getting two pounds of each, so there's not a lot of flexibility there. Oh, look, Mega Grocery's got 15 mediums. And so, okay. Now here, I'm using my small unit equivalent thinking. I have 18 small units here, but here, each of these is 2.5 small units. So I'm like, uh, so 
I mean, this is actually 30 small units. So I'm, I'm doing these mental calculations in my head to think about where can I steal product from? So if it's Tuesday and I realize we're probably gonna be short on Friday, I'm checking in with these customers. Hey folks, just seeing in how sales have been going lately. You know, it looks like we might be short. We're scheduled to bring you, you know, 18 small, small on, um, on Friday. Can you do with 15? And most customers are going to be very uh, adapt, you know, accommodating to that because they understand that. And so what I might do is sort of shift my, my Jane's Grocer from 18 to 15 in all of these. And what that's doing is it's freeing up crop that I can use for somebody else. And so what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go through my customers and, and, and basically shift those products until I have enough extra product to meet those new product needs. Now, what you're going to find a lot of the time is, is by doing this regular communication with your customers, so, sometimes they're going to go like, oh, yeah, you know what? Actually, we've been a little overstocked. That's great. So that's going to get us sort of back on schedule to having the right amount of product. Your customers don't want too much product either. It means they're, they're paying money for products they're not using in a timely manner, which means there's a higher risk of it going off before they can sell it or use it. So, so by having this communication with your customer on a regular basis, it allows you to, to adapt to their needs better. Even though you've told them standing orders, you can't cancel your orders, the, the reality is they're going to do that. Um, oh, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, so the other situation here might be um, Jane's Grocery cancels their order. Um, oh, actually, no. The other thing I want to talk about is down below, and this is just how the spreadsheet is designed, my farmer's market order is here. Now, the easiest way to shift products is to and from your farmer's market. So if we get cancellations from our, from our restaurants and grocers, we take more stuff to the farmer's market. And if we need more stuff for those orders, we just take it from our farmer's market stock. So if you're doing a regular farmer's market, that makes product shifting really easily. What's the main reason we don't wanna take product away from our farmer's market uh, products? Why would we not wanna do that? I'm not sure how much <clears throat> farmer's market folks here have done. No, no one's taking a stab at that. We don't want to sell out too soon. So yes, we don't want to run out too soon at the market for sure. But what's another reason? So one thing you might notice here, uh, you definitely, so yes, and so you wanted abundance on your table. Um, that gets a little complex because uh, we don't display our product at, at the market. We keep all our product in coolers all the time. We always use live trays for display, um, but ideally um, you would, yeah, you would have as much on display as possible. That's, um, you want to be able to cover the pay of the person running your stall. Okay, so this is, you're getting to it there, Cecilia. Uh, so, and these are all, these actually are all great answers. Um, here, I'm doing sunflower and I'm selling them at uh, $5 per small bag. Up here, my grocery store, I'm selling them at $4 per small bag. So your farmer's market pricing is usually the most premium pricing you have. When you're selling to a grocer, you're doing, um, you're selling to somebody who's going to sell it to somebody else, which means you need to knock your price down so they can mark it up. And the way you, you benefit from that is you may be getting a lower price, but you're getting a larger volume. You don't need to stand there for hours selling it. You drop it off at the grocery store and you walk away. So there's, there's trade-offs between those things. So lower price, but higher volume and less work. So one reason, the thing is, it's a lot of work for the farmer's market. So it's a lot of expense. It's your highest price. So if you're going to be there, you want to have as much product to sell as possible. And as folks said, if you, um, if you show up with, with not enough product, uh, you're going to sell out too early. You're going to have disappointed customers. And over time, you learn. We used, to, we used to text customers like, hey, are you coming to the market today? We're low on stock, and I can put a pound aside for you. Not coming today? Great. Then we don't need that. 
You are coming today? Great. Your pound will be here waiting. So you're always trying to make sure you, you um, uh, um, prioritize your guaranteed sales. Holding something for a potential sale is always risky if there are other sales somewhere. Um, so that's all, again, that becomes uh, decision making. Um, so yeah, so this is shifting. So what do you do with surplus? Uh, you have multiple things you can do with surplus. So the other thing, and this is what I was going to get to here, um, you know, Jane's Grocery cancels her order, or even by Wednesday, it's Wednesday, and we see the weather forecast for Saturday is going to be shitty. So we know days ahead of the case, like market's going to be slow, bad weather, people aren't going to come out. So first thing we do, we start contacting our current customers. Hey, how's your stock doing? We've got some extra product. Can we bring you some new stuff? Uh, or can we bring you some more? Or it's like, hey, we know you just use sunflower, but we're, we're doing some half price radish. I mean, you want to get that stuff out the door any way possible. Selling radish to an existing customer at half price is better than composting it. Uh, it's better than having to eat it all as well, which is also problematic in a different way. So, so you, you, again, you're always thinking about what can I do with this? You can, you can throw it out and I see it on Instagram and Facebook all the time. Hey, we have extra product, you know, we have this, we have that. Uh, th that can be, have varying degrees of success. Your, your, your most likely avenue uh, for a sale in my experience has been selling more to existing customers as opposed to bringing on a new customer last minute. It often can take weeks or months to get a new customer on board for various reasons. A restaurant has a set menu. They don't have radish shoots on their menu. So why would they buy radish shoots from you? So anyways, lots of things can play out there. So one is trying to sell more product to your existing customer. The other one is if you're at the farmer's market is, so every week at the farmer's market, you need to mingle with the other people at the farmer's market. You want all the other people at the farmer's market to be your best friend so you can trade product with them. And lots of people do this. So we would trade microgreens for other food and we would train, trade microgreens for other products. So I used to do a trade with a, with a potter. You know, he, I would pick pottery every few weeks and he would just run a tab and take microgreens and eventually be like, okay, now I can get a bowl and now I can get a mug. And I always felt really guilty about that. I'm like, I just have to give you microgreens and you're going to give me this cool bowl. And he's like, yeah, but if, if I didn't do this, I wouldn't eat these things, right? So th th these are shared benefits. So um, yeah, so you need to learn to, to, to use that. So when you have excess product, you can use it in a way that it still has value. The other thing you can do, and this is what someone was talking about here is, is there somewhere you can take that product and donate it uh, afterwards so it doesn't go to waste? Uh, it can be really, really hard not to waste product when you're busy because you know, taking food somewhere as a donation or waiting for a pickup, it also takes time, which means it takes labor, which means it has a cost to it. You know, giving food away still requires some work. So the, the better system you have set up, the more easy that's gonna be. So we had a, uh, a system, yeah, on Saturdays after our market, we could actually just stop by a place on the way and drop our excess off. So it's still very fresh and we would get a donation receipt for that. So, so it actually worked out really well. So you've got to be able to adapt to those things. Again, our crop plan is a model. We're using that model to, get, to set projections so we can have hopefully the right amount or a reasonable amount of product to meet our orders and our future orders. We don't want so little that we are going to lose sales and we don't, don't want so much that we are going to end up growing stuff that we can't sell. And so fine tuning helps you adapt to that stuff in your calculations and in your just sort of week to week, uh, um, sort of how you shift crops between customers to make sure when there is a change, whether expected or unexpected, you're not ending up with too much product or missing out on sales. Uh, so that is all I'm gonna cover for today. I always try to get this within an hour. I'm always a little bit over, um, but we started a little late, so maybe that's okay. Uh, so I'll leave it open now uh, to questions actually. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Look at each other. I got to move you guys up to this screen now. So yeah, if folks have questions of specifics about what we covered. Maybe something we didn't cover. You're like, well, what about this situation? Um, yeah, this is a good time for that. And you can you can uh, unmute yourself to ask questions for this portion. Uh, 
I don't have a question right off, but I do just appreciate, I feel like in the beginning of my microgreens, when I was about a year into growing, my hesitancy with using a spreadsheet was that it seemed so precise. And my experience was that there was some flux with growing and with managing my farm. And so I really appreciate how you have built in that flux with buffers, with virtual customers, um, so that you are really, uh, able to still run an effective farm and it's it's realistic you can still implement this and use your brain as well in figuring out how like when you're talking about shifting products and all of that it's just um, I really appreciate you can tell that this was developed by someone who actually grew microgreens and actually ran a microgreens farm um, because I've looked at other farm software and it just I don't see how it would work without me having to do a lot of extra work also so I just want to say I appreciate really appreciate that about what you've developed here and that it's it's so specific to what applies to a microgreens farmer so that, I just think it's awesome. Yeah, and one thing to consider which I didn't cover is I mean if if I'm a farmer and I'm growing carrots or beets or something else and I don't harvest them this week, I'll harvest them next week. You know, they're they're in the ground they're going to be a little bigger. Sometimes that's not the case. Uh, arugula might go to seed or something like that. Um, but microgreens, you can go from not mature enough to perfect to over mature in a day. You know, I have a very precise window that I'll harvest my pea shoots at. There's a point with the speckled pea. As soon as that tendril shows, I'm like, it's done. I would never sell that product to somebody because it's not tender anymore. Now, I feel like a cow chewing cud because it's so fibrous. I'm just chewing and chewing and chewing. It looks lovely, but it's not the product that I want to represent what we're doing. People talk about this with sunflowers starting to get their true leaves, they get more bitter, they get furry. Uh, wheatgrass can go from super sweet and still intense to like really gross and intense, like within half a day. So the thing is, you, you've got this window and a lot of people don't have the space, say, to put something in a cooler to slow it down. And so if you, if you can't move that product, then you're, 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 you can't do anything with it. And we have like as much as we have these systems in place, we're like, yeah throw those trays of wheatgrass on the compost pile. There's nothing to do with them. There's no way to juice all that because, you know, it's way too much. We don't have a market for it. So yeah, no matter how accurate your crop planning is, you're still going to get situations where you're definitely going to be a little bit off for sure. Somebody's mowing the lawn. So folks, are they, everybody's got everything figured out there? Did you have a question, Yanni? Oh, you're, you're still, on, you're on mute, Yanni. So yeah, there we go. Oh. Sorry, there you go. Okay. Um, as soon as I saw your spreadsheet, like my mind just went like a light bulb, I'm like it's done. <laughs> Not to worry about writing things or reflecting it's saved and, and backed up because I lose papers like crazy. But um, yeah, the spreadsheet really, I could really follow a technology that quick. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, one of the reasons, I mean, there's, there's multiple goals for doing a workshop like this. Like to be blunt, we want you to buy our spreadsheet. You know, we've put this work into it. We want you to use it because we want it to be better. But I also want people to develop their own spreadsheets. And the reason, one of the reasons I know crop planning so well is because I spent so much time doing it. And I mean, every time I'm making additions to the spreadsheet, I'm like, oh, like I never thought about it this way. But now that I'm doing this calculation, I understand things in a different way. And so that's really one of the driving factors. I mean, if you're doing the course with Laura, you're learning about how to grow microgreens, how to grow a business. And this is part of that. Like, okay, well, how do I do these calculations? And how does that make me a better grower? How is that gonna make me a more successful business? Absolutely buy the product when you need it because because that experience allows me to develop something that's more advanced, but you can learn a lot from developing this stuff yourself. So if you've got enough sort of spreadsheet savvy, it's worth spending some time doing that. So for next week's webinar, we are gonna look at some spreadsheet stuff. I mean, spreadsheet, learning spreadsheets takes time and it's really boring to watch. So we won't get into the detail that people need to, to develop something as elaborate as, as I've done, but it's gonna give you a sense of how to format things and some of the key formulas to use. So you can start to do that stuff and make it more simple. I mean, there's some stuff on my spreadsheet when I, when I find an error, like I'm like, how did I figure this out? 
I mean, some <laughs> of it is just ridiculously hard. So, um, so yeah, so, but it is good to know all these principles and all these elements like we talked about in the first one. So you can piece that stuff together and you, you, will, you will understand your be business better because of it. But like Laura said, it's just a model. It's not an absolute. So you have to learn how to adapt. And that's where you as a manager come into things. Yes, Chris. Yes, Chris Thoreau. What, do you, what did you want to ask? <laughs> am I Chris? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, that's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Neelan. Uh, uh, I'm really happy for it too. I, I used to try a lot for a week. And after sitting six months with spreadsheet, this big and this big, and ten of them not cooperating. It's just Christmas Eve to open yours. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm very thankful for it. Yeah, There's one thing I wonder, uh, because I'm uh, scaling up now, and I have to change my harvest day, and maybe even make two. Um, so I wonder now. I put all the regular orders in the uh, repeating orders in for my customers, but I want to shift from Thursday to. Wednesday, and that's grayed out in the orders. When I make the orders, when I go in and check, oh, it's grayed out. Is that also grayed out in the one when I'm finished with the trial? Or if yes. I buy the right one now, I can change it? Uh, so, so the way seed leaf works is you cannot change that, you cannot change that harvest date. Um, I won't get into too much detail here for this, but what you need to do is you need to set a future date when you want to shift and then you basically just cancel that order because you if you shift an order from a wednesday to a thursday that's a new order it's a, so when we yeah. talked about this yeah. in the first yeah. one so you have a customer you have a, a product you have a specific order date so what you're doing and you would do this in the spreadsheet as well you cancel those orders you change you, you create a new order with a new date and so in that case same thing you look into the future okay when do we want to make that change from here on we're going to cancel this and all the following orders and then we're going to create a new order to replace them on a different day and that'll sh basically that's going to shift all your tasks to different days as well so yeah you do that in the future but you have to delete those orders and create new ones okay okay yeah so so even with a good model you, you come into complications like that and you have to decide what's the best way to do it whether you're developing software or a spreadsheet uh, mm -hmm. and then then it's just a matter of what are the rules in these situations and then you follow those rules to make sure you get back mm -hmm. on track yeah yeah, yeah. good uh, a question there. So seed leaf is uh, 125 US dollars per year. And then the paid version does come with some templates of the spreadsheet because the spreadsheet has way more detail in it than, than seed leaf does at the moment. And the spreadsheet is really good for modeling a season. I mean, what everybody should be doing in like late November, December is thinking about what you want your next season to look like. And so with a spreadsheet, you sort of put in some theoretical but reasonable numbers, and then it'll kick out like, okay, well, this is what your labor costs will be, and this is what your revenue will look like. This is uh, how much it'll cost. This is how much seed you'll need. And so it's giving you a sense of what your year could look like if all these conditions were met. And again, you're modeling your year. And so you can look at that and go like, ah, oh, that's not enough money. We need to make more sales. So you put in more sales, and that gives you some sales goals. And that's going to change how you do your planning. Um, but then you might use something like Seedly for the day-to-day -day stuff. And the reason is spreadsheets are just ridiculously overwhelming. Like at least two people had a panic attack when I pulled up that spreadsheet. You're like, oh my God, it's so much information. Um, and on spreadsheets, it's really, really easy to, uh, you know, delete a formula or delete a cell that's really important and be like, now nothing works. It's really, really hard to do that with online software. Though some people have managed to do it. Um, yeah, somebody crashed the program because they put in 200 years worth of orders. <laughs> so uh, that ended up being a little more than the system could handle. So yeah, I mean, there's different systems for different situations. You know, spreadsheet is good for longer term projections than something like Seedleaf is really good for just day to day stuff. So you just need the basics. What do I do today? Just show me what I need to do today. Don't show me all this other stuff. And yeah, the idea is just so you're not so overwhelmed with information that's actually of no use to you. Would I be able to incorporate other things from my small farm on this spreadsheet as well? So I'm working from one unit. So th this is a good question. So theoretically, yes. You, if you again, if you had a, a projected harvest date, so let's just use uh, tomatoes as an example. 
you and you set your sort of first when when do I want to have my tomatoes ready by? We'll say uh, July seventeenth. I don't know if a July 17th market that I want to have tomatoes ready for. I know my tomato uh, variety is 65 days to maturity from transplanting. And so our germination stage would technically be our like starting indoors and transplant stage. And then our uncovering stage would be our transplanting out stage. So if you put the numbers in right and you're, you're sort of setting your, your, win, your target for, for July 17th, it would calculate your theoretical sowing date. And this is how... I mean, this is how crop planning for farmers works. It's exactly what they do. This is all based on, on those same models. I certainly haven't invented the idea of working back from a set harvest date. Um, but the one thing that seed leaf does not account for is location. So on a regular farm plan, you might have, okay, let's in field two and bed five. I mean, generally farmers have like, there's a room. And so everything's in the same room. We are looking at ways. We do have one, one user that, that grows on two different sites. And so you could have farm one and farm two. And there's a potential that you could assign a shelf to it, for example. Again, that's stuff that you should be doing. As soon as we, we can always incorporate the stuff into a spreadsheet or a program, but it starts to make it more complicated than it needs to be. And then it starts ceasing to serve its purpose properly. So yeah, you could give it a try. Uh, and it might work better with something like arugula that has a 30 to 40 day life cycle, which isn't too far off from something like a basil microgreen, which you know can be 20 to 30 days. And if you did succession, so you wanted to harvest arugula every week, you could set up a recurring order with a, with a 30 days to maturity, and that should be fairly accurate for your, your arugula throughout a season. Yeah. Great. Well, I think this was incredibly helpful. Um, the, the question has surfaced in this, in this program um, by many of you and uh, about scaling, about, okay, once you get the basics down, you get growing some microgreens, you get a few customers, how do you make that leap from doing this on a small scale where you're maybe making a little bit of money to scaling it up to where you are making more money, where you're actually really being profitable, making that leap can feel really challenging. Uh, what you need is something like this. You need something to help get you organized and to help with your efficiency. Your time becomes so critical for most of the people in this group. They are not microgreens farmers full time. Some are, uh, most are not. And so finding a tool that's going to help you to be more efficient is, is so key. And that's what this is kind of giving you a window. If you haven't signed up for the free trial yet, uh, I sent you an email. I will send another one. Get in there and look around and see if it's something that is going to fit your, <clears throat> sorry, my voice, your, your goals and what you're wanting to do with your, your farm. But I just, uh, this, I think it's so such great timing, Chris, that you're coming and teaching all of us because this question keeps coming up. Okay, I've got the basics down, but how do I go from here to the next level? How do I up-level my, my farm and my production? And you need help, you need a tool, you need a way to make sure that you are keeping yourself organized, you're being as efficient as possible uh, with your crop so that your revenue is where you want it to be. So that whole idea of sowing with purpose, uh, this is what's gonna help you do that, uh, really, really dialing things in. So I just wanted to thank you again for your time and I look forward to um, the final session next week.